coming up on Doctype, I'm going to show you how to use color models in CSS3. Then, Jim will show you how to make your very own bookmarklets. So dust off that Halloween candy because it's time for Doctype. <laughs> This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Site5 and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. Oh, yes, we do. So this week, uh, Adobe has released an early prototype of a tool they're calling Edge. And basically what it is, is it's a GUI tool that allows you to manipulate CSS3 animations on a timeline, a lot like you can with Flash. So they've gone over some of the interface tools in this demo video where they show us how you can adjust timing with your CSS3 animations and a lot of cool other stuff. Now it's still really early, but it's great to see a company like Adobe starting to build tools that allow us to author HTML5 and CSS3 applications instead of Flash. Very cool stuff. But it'll definitely make the move to HTML5 a lot easier. Yeah, good things to come. So I want to remind you that we are on YouTube. <laughs> at youtube.com slash doctype tv and we are also on facebook so be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype so this week nick is going to be talking about css3 color models and i'll be showing you how to make your own bookmarklets let's check it out so in addition to CSS2 color models, CSS3 introduces even more. This can be pretty confusing, so let's see if we can go ahead and sort things out. So first up is the RGBA color model. This is a good one to start with because in the last week's episode, we learned about RGB. RGBA works exactly the same with the one exception of the one additional value at the end. The A stands for alpha or alpha channel. This is a value between 1 and 0 that is a measure of how opaque or transparent a color is. 1 is completely opaque, as you see in this example, but if we set the alpha to a value between 1 and 0, such as 0 0.6, it will drop our alpha channel down to 60% opacity. It looks just like a lighter color against a white background, but when we add a few elements behind it, you can see that this orange element interacts with the other colors. You should take advantage of RGBA when you want elements to appear a bit more subtle or blend into their background just a bit more. Next up is HSL. HSL is an acronym that stands for Hue, Saturation, and Lightness. And HSL is very different from the other color models that we've encountered so far because even hex is based on RGB. So the first value, hue, can be a number between 0 and 360. If that sounds like degrees in a circle to you, you're on the right track. It's a degree value that represents a point along a rainbow color wheel. So 0 is at the top of the color wheel and it represents red. Because in our example, we're at the 36th degree, we're actually pretty close to red, so we get this nice orange color. The second value, which represents saturation, is a percentage. Saturation is a measure of how vibrant a color appears. 100% is the maximum. However, if we were to turn down the saturation to 50%, we would start to get kind of a brownish color like this. If we set the saturation to zero, the element becomes completely gray and doesn't have any color at all, really. The last value is lightness, which is also a percentage. If you turn this up to 100%, your color will become pure white, and if you turn it down to 0%, it will become completely black. Therefore, if you leave it at about 50%, your colors will appear as you'd expect them to, at kind of a nice, bright saturation. However, if you want to do something that's tinted a bit darker, or maybe looks washed out, you can adjust this value as necessary. Now, just like RGB and RGBA, HSL also comes in the HSLA variety if you need to use an alpha channel. The last value is, once again, a number between 0 and 1. Here, we've turned down the opacity to 
Now, there is one more color model called CMYK, but actually browser support is so bad for this at this point, it's actually not even worth talking about yet. Uh, everything I've showed you will work in all the major browsers like Firefox, Safari, Chrome, and Opera, except for Internet Explorer. However, Internet Explorer in version 9 will be supporting these CSS3 color models. Now, when we come back, Jim is going to show you how to make bookmarklets. How to make bookmarklets. But before that, let's take a look at Site 5. Whether you need shared hosting, a managed VPS, or managed dedicated hosting, Site 5 has you covered. Site 5 is really great because of their amazing customer satisfaction. Site 5's Backstage allows you to manage multiple users, domains, add ons, and upgrades, and you can, of course, check the status of your server and your support tickets. Beyond their money back guarantee and uptime guarantee, Site 5 even has a free migration service. Check them out at site5.com. If you use the discount code DOCTYPE, you'll get 10% off a yearly shared hosting account. There are tons of hosting options out there, but none of them are quite like Site 5. Now, you may be familiar with bookmarklets like the readability tool and wondered how you can make one of your own. Well, making a functional bookmarklet is easier than you think. Now, how a user installs a bookmarklet is that they drag a link from a page into their bookmarks toolbar, which creates its own little bookmark. Then, when they want to use it, they just click on the bookmark, and some effect will be applied to that page. In the case of readability, that effect is to take the main content of the page and format it in a consistent way that's very easy to read. So how does this work? Well, it all stems from JavaScript. In fact, this exact phrase right here, JavaScript colon, which is a JavaScript URL. Now, a JavaScript URL starts with a JavaScript keyword and a colon, and then after that is some JavaScript code. Now, we can use this JavaScript URL by just placing it into a web browser's URL bar. So, for instance, if we were on the doctype.tv site and we were to paste this code right into the toolbar and execute it, well, what would happen is our alert would be executed and we'd see an alert box on our page regardless of what page is being shown. Now, we can use this JavaScript URL inside of an anchor tag and set the href to this JavaScript colon and then our code, and this will create a link. Now, if you click on this link on the page, it'll execute the JavaScript right on that page. But if the user drags it to their toolbar, they can now execute that code on whatever page that they're on, which is what we call a bookmarklet. Now, there are some size and limitations because basically we are creating a URL, and so we're limited to the basic size of a URL inside of a browser. Now, in Internet Explorer, this is about 2,000 kilobytes. This is about 2,000 characters. In other browsers, it's more, but you have to plan for the worst case. And there's also a problem of formatting. If we have a lot of code that we want to be executing, constantly reformatting it to fit in the href attribute of an A tag is really problematic. So what we can actually do is make our bookmarklet act as a bootloader, and its only job is going to be loading in an external JavaScript file. So the code for that looks a little something like this. Now, you can see on our first and last line, we start with our JavaScript colon, making it a JavaScript URL. And then our code consists of a self-executing anonymous function. And the reason we're doing this is because we're creating variables, and we don't want those variables to become global on the page. And that's because our bookmarklet might be executed on any page on the internet, and we don't want to be interacting with the JavaScript environment on that page in a destructive way. So by creating a function and immediately executing it, we're containing this s and all the other variables and functions that we call to that local namespace so we don't disturb anything else. Now the next thing we do is create a script element like you would see in an HTML page to load a JavaScript. To do that, we call document.createElement and say we're going to create a script element. So now s is a script element, and we can set the src attribute to the URL of the file that we want to load into the page. So something like year.site slash script.js. Finally, the last step is to call document.body.appendChild and pass it that script tag. What this will do is it'll actually add the script into the flow of the page, which will make the browser immediately download that file and execute it. Now, our actual script can be really anything, and I recommend, again, you place all of your actual application code inside of a self-executing anonymous function. That way, you can have your own local variables without interacting with anything else on the page. 
Now when we compress all that code down and remove the white space and the new lines and place it into an A tag, it looks a little something like this. Now it's a little bit messy, but you really only have to worry about changing the URL of the script.js file that you want to load. And then that file is all the application logic that you need. So you really don't have to mess with this template very much. Now one last thing is a note about security, and it's not really so much for developers, but for users of bookmarklets. When you use a bookmarklet, you're basically trusting the bookmarklet author with all the contents of the page that you're executing it on. They'll have access to all the variables on the page, all the content on the page, and even your cookies. And there's nothing stopping the bookmarklet from sending that information back to the author for malicious reasons. So whenever you're using a bookmarklet, make sure you trust the source. And if you have any really sensitive pages that you don't want to lose the inf that you don't want information to leak about, make sure to not utilize bookmarklets on those pages. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctite.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code DOCTYPE3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for this week until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe via itunes or rss or youtube you'll never miss an episode of doctype so why not so until next Tuesday, remember that every great web page starts with Doctype.